Is this the end of an era? The man who was the face of the Kurdish fight for independence steps down. What will it mean for the Kurdish region of northern Iraq? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Masoud Barzani. He fought to bring independence to his people. But after a contentious referendum, Masoud Barzani has stepped down after 12 years at the helm of the Kurdish regional government. Now, Barzani says his authority should be shared between different branches of government. But while MPs discussed the plan on Sunday, Barzani supporters stormed the regional parliament and attacked opposition politicians. A little over a month ago, people in the region voted overwhelmingly to break away from Baghdad. But that led to days of fighting with Iraqi forces, which retook the city of Kirkuk. Now the region is in turmoil, but the outgoing KRG leader stands by his decision. So what will Barzani's legacy be, and how will his resignation impact the region? Yvette McCullough takes a look. In just a few weeks, Masoud Barzani has gone from the champion of his people's long fought for dream to resigning from his long-held presidential post. A rapid fall from grace that's left big question marks over the future of the Kurdish regional government's autonomy. Barzani was the architect behind last month's controversial referendum in which 90% of voters backed independence for northern Iraq's Kurdish region. The plebiscite was ruled illegal by Baghdad and rejected internationally. It was a high-stakes gamble that backfired. The Iraqi central government responded by closing the KRG's airspace to international traffic and launched a military offensive, rapidly seizing key territory and assets held by Kurdish Peshmerga since 2014, including the oil-rich city of Kirkuk, which would be fundamental to the economic self-reliance of any future Kurdish state. The Kurdish independence referendum was meant to find peaceful solutions to problems with the Iraqi government. We told them that we are ready to enter into dialogue and put off independence for two or three years to find solutions to problems with Baghdad. But for Baghdad, that wasn't enough. It's insisted that the referendum be completely annulled, raising fears that Bazani's power play has instead put the KRG's years of autonomy in jeopardy. Bazani was one of the forces behind the creation of the semi-autonomous region, coming into power in 2005. His term was officially meant to end in 2015, but this was extended twice because of the region's fight against Daesh. Elections due to be held on November 1st were postponed. That's left the KRG in political limbo, with presidential powers and duties set to be shared among the Prime Minister, Parliament and the Judiciary. The referendum and its fallout exposed factions and divisions among Iraqi Kurds. Many Peshmerga fighters defending KRG assets and territory surrendered without much resistance. Fights broke out in parliament shortly after Barzani's resignation was announced, and some Barzani supporters stormed the building, attacking opposition MPs and media. With the KRG's political position looking delicate, there's concern about who will lead now. But with Barzani's nephew as Prime Minister and his party still controlling Parliament, there's speculation that Barzani will still be pulling the strings from outside office. Potentially leaving the KRG in the same position, but now with a hand that's been severely weakened and a dream of self-determination in ruins. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Joining me now from Choman in northern Iraq is Kamal Chomani. He is a political analyst at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. We also have Abdullah Hawez. He is a Middle East analyst and researcher at King's College London. And completing our panel from Washington, D.C., we have Yerevan Saeed. He's a KRG expert from the Middle East Research Institute. Well, let me begin in Iraq with uh, Kamal Chomani. Barzani may say he doesn't regret pushing through this referendum against the advice of all his top international allies. But now that he's resigned, how do you, as an observer, view his decision? Thanks for having me. Uh, first, of, first of all, I think Barzani would not resign if he had not, if he had not been under the pressure of Kurdish people 
political parties as well as Iraq regional countries, especially Turkey and the international community, especially the United States. And I think his resignation was, uh, was a historical move for the Kurdish people and even for himself because he brought the Kurdistan region for, for this collapse and the referendum was a colossal mistake. And he, he, he may not regret for, for holding referendum because he might think that it was a, a huge or a, a big achievement in his political life. But um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, it, was a, it was a success. And if you, if you what, what referendum brought for the Kurdish people was a disaster. And now we have lost you know, half of the Kurdistan region, the uh, oil fields in Kirkuk and other disputed areas, the whole disputed areas, and especially Kirkuk, let alone that, you know, uh, the Peshmerga forces was, you know, in, in, the, in the international community or, or in the whole region were appeared as heroes. But now they, 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 they were defeated easily by, by the, uh, uh, the Iraqi uh, Haj al-Shaabi popular mobilization force and the Iraqi army. And now also his referendum brought the Kurdistan region to another, you know, at the, at the edge of another division, returning back to the two administration. Let alone that, you know, Masoud Barzani and even other political uh, leaders have called this, uh, this withdrawal from Kirkuk a, 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 a betrayal. And, you know, calling each other traitors and betrayal, it brings us back to the days of, you know, civil war, when the KDP and PUK started civil war, thousands of people were killed and thousands okay. were displaced. Okay. L let me ask uh, Abdullah Hawaz in London then, if, if you agree uh, with Kamal there, was this a colossal mistake on Barzani's behalf? Uh, indeed, it was a big miscalculation. I mean, um, but uh, let's be honest here. The, uh, some of the problems, especially the disputed areas in Kirkuk and elsewhere, they were all already a problem. Like, even if we didn't have a referendum after Iraqi army was retaking most of the territory elsewhere in Iraq, they would have come to Kirkuk because uh, I don't think they would accept a unilateral imposition of force by Kurds in the disputed territories. So th I think this, uh, there is a mismatch or mixing up between the, 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 the case of losing a disputed territory with the referendum. I think there are two different cases. But uh, a referendum in itself, the timing of the referendum was, was a big uh, miscalculation. I think most of the uh, political parties uh, in Kurdistan also agree with that. Even a lot of uh, officials within the Kurdistan Democratic Party would uh, agree on that. So he was right to the, resign? I think he was right, but he was also uh, talking about resignation even, even uh, months ago. He was, he was claiming he's not going to... Uh, extend his uh, tenure and he, he is going to resign after the referendum. I think uh, the, the, the fail out and the setbacks after re the referendum accelerated uh, his, his uh, resignation or ending his term as the president of Iraqi Kurdistan. Okay, Yerevan, let me ask you, uh, they may agree that he made a, a big mistake, that this was a massive miscalculation, uh, but you still seem, seem to think Masoud Barzani will remain a very serious player in the KRG behind the scenes. How so? Uh, for sure, so, even though Barzani decided to resign from his official capacity as the president of the Kurdistan region, I guess he will be central for the Kurdish politics for for months and even for years uh, to come, because as he said that he would remain as a fighter, he would remain as a Peshmerga, and he will fight for the Kurdish uh, cause. And uh, I think Barzani re will remain at the background. I think all the de decision, uh, decision, important decisions that are related to the fate of the Kurdish uh, people will be run uh, by him as well. And also, let's not to f uh, forget that Barzani will remain at the head of the uh, Supreme Political Council, which was established by, uh, by Barzani and also other Kurdish parties after the, the, re the referendum. So for me, even though like, he decided to resign because potentially uh, because of the referendum that backfired, because of his miscalculation, and also not, uh, let's not forget, as Abdullah mentioned, that Barzani said before the referendum that he would take personal responsibility 
for whatever happens after the referendum. So the referendum and the miscalculation was a big factor in resignation of President Barzani. But in the meantime, there was no any legal mandate for him to be, uh, to be the president of Kurdistan region after the referendum because his tenure was officially expired in 2013. And then the parliament gave him two okay. more years. And then through a very questionable uh, consultative council, he was given on the two years in 2015. Okay, Kamal Chomani, I just want to ask you about that, uh, that outlook there. I mean, and do you welcome Barzani playing a role, or some sort of almost leadership role then behind the scenes going forward? We should not forget Masoud Barzani is the leader of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which is the main party in the Kurdistan region. He is also the son of Mullah Mustafa. He was a, the leader of the Ilo Revolution back in the 1960s. And now Masoud Barzani, uh, through his, his political party, has controlled everything in the Kurdistan region. Uh, nephew and son-in-law is Nashirvan Barzani, the prime minister of the Kurdistan region. Judiciary system is somehow controlled by the KDP. And the Security Council... Uh, Kamal, I'm going to interrupt you there. It seems seems we're having some problems with your audio up. Let's just take a... I'll come back to you in just a minute. I'd, let's just move it forward then at this point. I'll turn it back to London. Abdullah, going forward for northern Iraq then, is there still a place for the KRG's independence movement? Or has that referendum, perhaps because it was held so, so prematurely, destroyed those ambitions uh, and the future, as well as the semi-autonomous status of, of the KRG? I think the uh, independence aspirations for now are almost dead uh, for the near future. But for the longer run, obviously, the, 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 the Kurdish aspiration for independence will stay there. The, the aspiration for statehood, statehood will stay there. But inside Iraq, I think um, uh, the problem is, even inside Iraq, uh, we have seen, we have witnessed a lot of setbacks uh, including KRG is losing uh, control over borders, in, uh, in, uh, lose over uh, joint uh, control in the disputed areas or yeah, joint controlling of the disputed areas. And even inside KRG, I, apparently uh, Mr. Abadi, the Iraqi prime minister, is uh, thinking of uh, sending the salary of the uh, Kurdish employees directly to the uh, provinces, which will further uh, undermine the, 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 the rule of the KRG. I think the, uh, but KRG as the uh, autonomous region will stay there, will remain there because of the, uh, uh, because of the protection or a de facto protection from the United States. Also because I don't think Mr. Abadi's aim is actually to dissolve, let's say, the Kurdistan region. But he, his aim is only to weaken it and to, to have an upper hand in the, in the relation with the KRG. OK, Yerevan, if you, if you have a comment, go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, I think the Kurdish nationalism and the aspiration will remain you know, as strong as ever, even though there might be some, uh, some like, you know, pessimism with the Kurdish public. But let's not forget that the Kurdish came out from the ashes of history. They survived several genocidal campaigns by the, by the former uh, regime, including the chemical attack on, on Halabja. So we, the Kurdish uh, people got into this day, and Barzani was able to bring the, the Kurds to the brink of independence, even though it was unsuccessful. But I think uh, there will be uh, the history is there. The, the aspirations of the Kurdish people cannot be erased. And also, as Barzani said, three million people cannot be annulled or related. Uh, erase it so uh, easily. But I think what's important here, you know, how Baghdad will handle this new situation, these new uh, conditions that have come to existence after the referendum. We have to ask whether Baghdad, under the leadership of Prime Minister Abadi, will change. It is modus operandi, whether it will, it will just you know, go back to the older policies of the former regime. Because if, if I give you a very short you know, historical snapshot, Baghdad always accommodated the Kurdish writers when it was weak. Let's just look at the 19, late 1950s when uh, the kingdom was, the monarchy was overthrown. Uh, the father of Barzani was in Soviet Union with the Peshmerga forces, and then at that time, Abdul Karim Qasim, the head of Iraq, uh, invited back Barzani because he needed the Kurds to 
and to attack the, uh, the Arab nationalists at, at that time. And when Abdul Karim Qasim was of a throne in, in 1963, then the Basis and the new uh, Arab nationalists needed the Kurds to suppress the, the communists. And, and the Kurdish were given you know, cultural economic rights until, uh, as, uh, as is clear from okay. 1970s, declaration of autonomy. So after Iraq becomes, you know, that's always the security dilemma the Kurds in Iraq have, have been living in. Okay. Iraq, when it's strong, it attacks the Kurds, it tries to weaken the Kurds. When it's weak, it needs uh, Kurds to balance the other forces. Okay, so the, so the aspirations, in essence, you believe, will be kept alive. Okay, let me ask Kamal then, uh, moving forward, is northern Iraq then, I've heard some analysts say this could become more evident going forward, if you believe it is a problem or not a problem. The northern Iraq and the KRG now being pulled in two opposite directions via Nechervan Barzani, who looks to replace um, Masoud Barzani, with his alliances with Turkey and the United States, while the PUK looks further toward an alliance with Iran, therefore pulling the government itself in two very much opposing directions. What do you make of, of that concern? The Kurdistan region, even though back in 2003 uh, was a united, you know, since 2003 it has been a united government, but practically it has never been a united government. The Peshmerga has always been two Peshmerga. The security forces have been two security forces, and even the decision making have always been, you know, two, two, uh, let's say, two fronts from Slemani and from Arbil. Even though I, th uh, the, the the scenario that you spoke about, it's still there. But I don't think the Kurdistan region will go for a, a division, because uh, there are still the people from the PUK and from the KDP, as well as from the opposition party, as well as the Kurdish society, do not accept it further division in the Kurdistan region. But politically, that is, that's for sure. The KDP has already been completely controlled by the by, ter by Turkish government or the AK party, and they cannot go away from the, from the control or from the monopoly of, of, of Turkey. And now, uh, because of all the Kurdish oil, there's only one pipeline. And for, for the KDP, exporting its oil be, be through truckers or through pipelines is not is not uh, is not available through through Iran or uh, through crossing border crossings with Iran. So that's why KDP will always remain allied with Turkey, no matter how much Turkey will put pressures on on the KDP. On the other side, PUK as well. PUK has a huge you know a long border with Iran. They have uh, they cannot export their own their own uh, oil through the, the crossing borders with Turkey. That's why they are also they remain allied with uh, with with Iran. In the meantime, KDP and PUK they will never be a united. They will never they will never believe in each other, and they are also afraid of their existence from from the uh, from each other and as as well as from a national strike from the people. That's why they always need a regional a regional ally or a regional uh, a regional party to protect them from each other. So that's why okay. I think that this division will remain. And no matter whether the relations of the KDP and Turkey are, are, are uh, deteriorated, but in the, in the future, I think they will again go back to the same. Okay. And for the PUK, the PUK has already, is, is still right. allied with Iran. We just have a few minutes left, so let me just finish with this. Uh, Abdullah Hawaz in London, if you can tell me, where you envision northern Iraq and the KRG in a year's time? Uh, in a year's time, I think the KRG would uh, remain within Iraq. They will have, uh, uh, probably they will restructure the relations with the Iraqi government, supervised by the United States. And uh, we will have, we will perceive some certain autonomy, but we will remain within Iraq, uh, within the current borders of Iraq. Yerevan Said? Uh, in my view, actually, it all depends on how the current uh, Kurdish leaders will, will act within the KRG, because KRG has lots of internal problems. It has problems, you know, between KDP, PUK, and other like, parties. PUK has problems with its own, with uh, its own uh, self, 
And also there's lots of economic problems. You know, people are on the streets. People have, rema uh, have remained, you know, unpaid for, for months. The KRG institutions are very weak. And also it all depends on the, or whether KRG will be able to provide the vision where it will go from now on, whether it will address the governance, the, uh, the issue of corruption, which is very deeply entrenched in the KRG uh, institutions, and whether it will be able to, to, uh, to be more transparent with its own people. Because, you know, as much as Baghdad is a problem, also the threat, but the internal Kurdish uh, issues between whether it's intra-party issues or whether social instability because of the failure of the Kurdish leadership to meet the expectation of the Kurdish people will indeed uh, decide where will the KRG will go on from now on. Okay, Yerevan, I will have to give you the last word. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'd like to thank all three of you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Still to come on The Newsmakers, the opposition in Venezuela looks completely disorganized. Will President Nicolas Maduro use the opportunity to strengthen his hand? And did Donald Trump's campaign collude with the Kremlin? A former advisor admits lying to the FBI about contacts with Russian officials. Venezuela's Democratic Unity Alliance seems anything but united. Four of its five state governors broke with party policy and swore allegiance to a pro-Maduro legislative body. Now, the already fractured opposition coalition seems close to collapse. It's been a tough year for them, securing only five out of 23 states in regional elections. Making things worse, three major opposition parties now refuse to even take part in local elections. So what does this all mean for Venezuela's opposition? And will President Maduro further strengthen his grip on power? Shoaib Hassan explains. He's the odd man out in a coalition that's falling apart. Juan Pablo Guanipa is a senior leader of the Democratic Union, the main opposition to Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. The central government dismissed him days after he was elected governor of the western Zulia state. This is a vulgar power play by those who didn't have the votes and were defeated and want to stay in power. Guanipa was removed after refusing to swear loyalty to the Constituent Assembly. The Assembly is a kind of temporary parliament and has 545 members. 364 are directly elected and 181 are chosen from different social sectors. The Assembly supersedes the powers of the National Parliament and can rewrite the Constitution. But the opposition has boycotted elections to the Constituent Assembly. It says the body will only strengthen the rule of President Nicolas Maduro. Three opposition politicians elected to the Tachira, Merida and Nueva Esparta states broke ranks and pledged their loyalty to the Assembly, despite previously saying they wouldn't. It's the second major blow to the opposition this month. They were expected to sweep recent elections for governors, but only managed to win five out of 23 states. It's now left them dispirited and in disarray. I will not continue at the round table. I will no longer be part of it. The time has come. I will not be part of an opposition, a sector of the opposition, because it's not unity as a concept or a vision. It's just some people that grab the bones that are thrown at them. Infighting appears to be causing the Democratic Union to fall apart. They now say they will boycott upcoming local council elections, where they were also ranked favorites. That strengthened President Maduro's hand. All that as ordinary Venezuelans continue to face food shortages and a fractured economy. That means more protests. Will that play to Maduro's advantage or will the opposition be able to reunite against him? Shoaib Hassan, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this now, I'm joined 
from Caracas by Victor Amaya. He's a journalist and editor based in Venezuela. And from London, Latin America analyst Javier Farge, who has just returned uh, from Venezuela. Thanks both so much for joining us. Victor, let me start with you. Why is what appears to be a crumbling opposition dangerous for Venezuela, in your opinion? Uh, the actual opposition, the alliance, was made to face uh, electoral scenarios. Uh, when the fight with the government, with the Maduro regimes, uh, doesn't uh, apply to that uh, reality, it's not about elections, it's not about these kind of elections, well, the opposition and the alliance start to uh, freak out uh, with all their members. They are, doesn't share the same objective or the same uh, kind of, uh, of fight that they have to pull out. Uh, to face uh, the Maduro's regime. So those, uh, those differences in opinion start to become more and more evident. And now it's a crumbling, as you said, on the alliance because they don't have a common uh, objective. Okay, and where then does that leave Venezuelan voters in your opinion? Well, with Maduro like uh, strengthening his power, like Maduro consolidating in, the, in power, and uh, with uh, all the answers as uh, what will happen on the near future on the political uh, reality in the country, uh, only depending on what the, the strongest alliance that the government uh, alliance can be uh, hold uh, or can hold uh, of the reality. Because inside the government, that's not a monolithic movement. That's a, a group of people with common interests. But uh, they also have their differences and their uh, factions. And maybe in this scenario with, with the oppositions, uh, looking at themselves in the mirror and looking uh, no further uh, from that, uh, th that image, the government is with all the power in his hands. And the alliance on the government is going to start to show their true faces uh, and, what, and how they can face the, the social crisis and the economic crisis that the country really faces right now. Okay, Javier, is a stronger Maduro because of a weaker opposition good for Venezuela? Well, uh, every democracy, every country needs a strong opposition uh, to make the government accountable for their actions. Unfortunately, as our colleague in Venezuela has said rightly so, that opposition does not fulfill that role because of the division within the opposition. You have, on the one hand, the pragmatists, those who believe that the opposition should take part in elections, and others, the more extreme elements, who just want to bring down the government and go to the streets and protest. And of course, there's been clashes between those two. Um, I'm not saying about violent, but you know, a big debate about the whole thing. And of course, Maduro has come out as, you know, stronger than before because of that. Again, our, my colleague in Venezuela is right when he says that uh, the, the Chavista camp is not monolithic. There have been disagreements in the, in the way, about the way the government is dealing with the economic situation in Venezuela, which is very serious. I've seen it by myself. At the same time, the opposition failed to win most of their governorships, and that created a great deal of disappointment among young people. Uh, Reuters has just produced a very interesting report, and Reuters is not a friend of the Maduro government, by the way, but he clearly, they clearly state that the young people are very disappointed because the opposition did not manage to win all these uh, you know, governorships that they expected in the 15th of October elections. I was in the latter state as an observer, and I saw how uh, the vote of the opposition crumble, uh, and I'm talking about numbers, I'm not talking about political allegiances here, I'm not discussing my own political allegiance, I'm talking about what I observed as, a, as an observer in Venezuela. So what happened is that Maduro comes out stronger. However, uh, as my co our colleague said in, in, in Caracas, uh, unless the economy is sorted out, there will be more disagreements within the ruling party in relation to what's going on there. The Constituent Assembly at the moment is trying to discuss the, what they call the post-oil economy, which will take years to materialize anyway, because it's not enough to put laws in the Constitution to solve the economic situation, although it has improved slightly in the last few months, but not enough to make people happy. At the same time, the problem the opposition has, I think, is that they overestimated the support that Chavistas had. And that is reflected in the way the media organizations that support the opposition have been reporting on Venezuela, as if the, as if the Chavistas did not exist. Well, they, they exist. I'm not saying that they have increased their vote. They haven't. They have a, a fixed, sort of like a 
seven to eight million voters that have not changed a lot since in the last ten years, but they come out in you know in, in masses to vote in okay. these fifteen of October elections, and and that made a difference in terms of. So the opposition does not offer an alternative to the people, and people are getting quite disappointed with it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Victor, let me ask you to help us better understand exactly. The opposition may be losing support because of the disunity uh, within the various parties and politicians, but what part of the opposition's actual policies are failing to gain voters? All, all the opposition, because there is no coherence in the message on the, on the strategy. But it's not uh, so true or only true that the leadership on the opposition is like the sole um, responsible for what, ha what has happened. Uh, the government has uh, tampered with the, with the elections, with the syst electoral system, because they, right now, you can vote, yes, but you can vote uh, and you are blackmailed by the box of food that they are going to give you. They, the government says, if you don't vote for me, you, maybe you can't access uh, of your food or medicine. It's not about that I'm going to give you a refrigerator, I'm going to give you a car, like, five, ten years ago. It's like you're not going to be able to buy food in our markets, in our public markets with our public uh, prices. Uh, you're going to be uh, buying food from the, the commercial chains of, uh, of, of the market with the prices on the free market. It's a lot, a lot, a lot uh, uh, bigger uh, prices in that, in that area. So we have a blackmailing uh, system that it's uh, making the people to go, in fact, vote for the Chavismo, not only because you believe in Chavismo, it's also because you need what Chavismo is doing for you, what Chavismo is, can give to you because Chavismo is in power. And Chavismo is controlling every uh, institution on the, on the country. The, the opposition gained the National Assembly, the Parliament, and the Parliament, within three months, from the election was uh, revoked of all the power by the, uh, the high court, the, the Supreme Court in Venezuela, and declared the, the parliament that is in, it was in disarray and it can, help, it can uh, do their function. So, okay. of course, the opposition can't make the government accountable for it, but it's not only because of the sole uh, leadership of the opposition. Okay, Javier, I can see you strongly disagree. Go ahead. Absolute utter nonsense, Victor. You're talking absolute nonsense. Listen, there's no sh shred of evidence that there's been a blackmail. The opposition has used two arguments to try to justify their defeat. One, the relocation of voting uh, polling stations, and then the replacement of candidates which was not accepted by uh, the Electoral Commission, which means that there were more than, in some cases, like Lara and Miranda, there were more than one opposition candidates. Those two arguments are completely out of the window because there was a deadline that the opposition did not fulfill to to show the replacement candidates and the, re and the relocation of stations in most of the states did not make a difference between the votes that the Chavistas got and the opposition got. You can go to Lara where I was, I was there, I never saw any attempt to blackmail anybody in terms of what to do. I saw the result before it was announced and there was a huge gap between the opposition and the government and therefore the Socialist Party won in Lara a, a, a victory that was accepted by Henry Falconi, the actual candidate of the opposition. So if the, if the opposition argues, as Victor says, that there was an element of blackmail, that people would not be given food or whatever if they didn't vote, why did they accept to take part in the 15th of October uh, uh, regional elections, if that, if that was the case? If they had concerns about this, the way the vote had been rigged and they have not uh, showed a shred of evidence in relation to the actual fraud that they claim has happened, then why did they accept to take part? It's very easy for them to just accept to take part in elections what they believe is con are going to be rigged and when they lose, oh well, we are crying foul because we didn't win. I mean, you know, they, okay. they only cry foul because they, they didn't win. That is an absurd argument and I, I don't accept that. And, and I was there, and I'm okay. sorry, I didn't see any, any evidence that was Victor, the case. Victor, I'll, I'll let you give a, a quick response to that. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's, th that's right. The opposition accepted to go under these rules. But the, the problem is not only those two factors. Of course, the, the way, uh, they have effect on the, on the result. But also, you have from, since 10 years ago, you have been uh, emptied the, for meaning the vote. Uh, when the opposition won the mayoral 
in, in Caracas, the mayor of Caracas, Alcaldía Metropolitana, uh, the government uh, emptied the competences of that dispatch, and they became they created uh, a parallel government in Caracas, and they has been uh, doing that on every time the opposition wins one electoral post. Uh, but also, uh, we have the government from years from now uh, inhabilitating uh, possible candidates and possible leaderships. We have uh, Enrique Capriles can run for office, Leopoldo Lopez can run for office, Manuel Rosales now can, but uh, 15 days ago didn't, uh, was able to, to run for office. So you have a government that is uh, selecting uh, to which people they want to face on an on a election. It's a, it's a problem with uh, more than just two denounces. And uh, on this election from 15, years, from 15 days ago, on Estado Bolívar, there are uh, evidence that the act, the, the numbers that were uh, counted by the okay. machines are one numbers, and the, and the numbers finally released by the, by the government, by the um, Electoral Council, were another. So there were rigged elections, manual voting, manual totalization in Bolivar that has not been addressed. Okay. Uh, uh, Javier, I know you disagree on that. You don't believe the elections were rigged at all. But I, I just need no. to ask Victor quickly, because we're focusing on the, on the disarray of the opposition here. Victor, I need to get your take on this. Are the four governors that broke ranks uh, with the opposition coalition that were sworn in against the policy. Are they sellouts, or in your opinion, did they really just do what they had to do because the opposition is, is so fragmented now? I believe they did what they had to do if they wanted to uh, take their places under the charges that they were elected for. Okay, so it wasn't worth trying to maintain the unity of this, this opposition coalition by, okay. Javier, I'll, I'll give you a minute then quickly if you did want to yes. passionately respond sure. to, to what you heard. Go ahead. Sure. I agree that the, the, the Bolivar state should be audited because there could be some reasons for the opposition to have uh, a complaint, although they have not shown uh, there's a discrepancy between the official figures and what the opposition has. And, and the, the figures that the opposition has might be rigged as well. So we don't really know that. The rest of the states, they all accepted victories and defeats. Indeed, the opposition won in two crucial states, Zulia and Tachira, uh, uh, which are on the border with Col Colombia. If the, if the government wanted sort of to manipulate things, they could have manipulated two key states, and they didn't do that. And in relation to the position, every, as I said at the beginning of, of this conversation, every government, every country needs a strong opposition. But an opposition that they don't know what they want to do, whether they want to take part or not, or you have disagreements within the opposition, they don't have a clear alternative plan to solve the economic situation, people will lose more and more confidence and they would rather stick to the devil they know rather than the devil they don't know. The opposition is not offering any valid alternative to the Venezuelan people, and that's why they are losing support from the young people, as Reuters uh, report and from the voters who decided not to give them the same confidence they gave them in the National Assembly elections in 2015. The opposition has to pull themselves together and offer an alternative to the Maduro government. For as long as they don't do that and they just want to bring down the government in any possible means, then they will continue to fail. You have for, for the far right to the far left in the opposition, they don't seem to agree in basics of how to solve the situation in Venezuela. For as long as that happens, then they will never be in power because they will not show a clear alternative. And Venezuelans okay. are not fools. They know exactly what's going on there. Okay. Victor, where do you think this leaves then the opposition now? What can be its next steps? Do you think they'll try to maintain this kind of broad coalition and even go on to finally start directly negotiating with the government? I think they, have, uh, they are obligated to go as a, as a one force because uh, next year, 2018, we have a, a presidential election. And whether or not they go to this uh, municipality election or these local elections in December, that has not been announced in what date they're going to be violating the law. Um, the, the presidential election is going to be next year. And if they want to, uh, to defeat Maduro's or the PCV or the Chavismo uh, <coughs> movement uh, by the, the electoral route, they have to organize themselves. They have to define a common strategy and a common uh, communication, a common uh, message to understand and to talk with those persons that are uh, some kind of uh, empowered for, for one day for, because of the protest that, that was uh, protagonism 
in Venezuela this year, but also with that people that are just being uh, coerced by the government because of the access of the food and the medicine and the social crisis that is really, really, really bad. Javier, go ahead. Uh, I agree that the opposition should pull themselves together. I doubt that they will fight a candidate because uh, uh, with different parties within the opposition are playing their own game, Acción Democrática, the old social democratic party that was in power for many years in Venezuela. They, the four, they won four out of the five opposition victories in the governorship. They are playing their own game within the opposition. They seem to be the strongest party at the moment. Other parties like Capriles, other people like Capriles, they don't want to be part of that opposition. I don't see how they can get a, a unified candidate when they don't really agree among themselves on how to do and where to participate or not. So I find it very difficult that we'll find a candidate in the little time that's left that will give an advantage to the Chavistas, obviously, who will have to uh, campaign very hard to maintain Maduro in the power. So we don't really know what's going to happen. Again, I believe that the opposition should pull themselves together because every democracy needs a strong opposition to take, uh, uh, you know, to make the governments accountable. If they don't do that, then they cannot expect to have the confidence of the Venezuelan people, and that will be they will only have themselves to blame for to be blamed for that, and not uh, the Chavistas and some kind of uh, fictional accusations of fraud and manipulation. But they really okay. need to put themselves together, and I really hope they succeed. Actually, okay. Javier, I will let you have the last word. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment. Javier Farge and Victor Amaya joining us there from Caracas. Thanks both so much for being on the Newsmakers. Thank you. Papadopoulos is an example of actually somebody doing the wrong thing while the president's campaign did the right thing. All of his emails were voluntarily provided to the special counsel by the campaign, and that is what uh, led to the process and the place that we're in right now was the campaign fully cooperating and helping with that. What Papadopoulos did was lie, and that's on him, not on the campaign, and we can't speak for that. Well, it seems President Trump can't shake those Russian rumors. Investigations into whether his campaign colluded with the Kremlin have dogged the U.S. president since he took office. And now we may have the most convincing evidence yet. George Papadopoulos, a former Trump foreign policy advisor, admitted he lied to the FBI when he denied meeting Kremlin-linked officials to secure incriminating information about Hillary Clinton. Add to that the president's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his long-term associate, Rick Gates, who face indictments now for conspiracy and money laundering. But Trump has hit back, calling Papadopoulos nothing but a lying low-level aide. Well, to help us make sense of all of this, I'm joined now from Washington by Harry Littman. He's a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Attorney General. Harry, thanks so much for joining us. For all the attention, the press attention that Manafort and Gates are really getting, it actually is Papadopoulos that could prove most dangerous to the president, correct? I think that's right. The first wave was all about Manafort and Gates, people that everyone had heard of who were part of the probe. No one had heard of Papadopoulos, but then when in the same uh, moment uh, they, they realized what he had been, uh, plea what he had pleaded guilty for, people quickly by around Monday afternoon put two and two together and realized this points much more directly at the president, at the campaign, at the overall charges of collusion with Russia in order to advance the, the Trump candidacy. And tell us more about that. What really is in his admission? Sure. It's a brief admission. And, you, and as your listeners just heard at the top, the actual uh, crime is lying to the FBI about a detail of timing. That's not the point in terms of the, uh, the incrimination of the campaign. What's in his ad admission is the um, uh, statements that he uh, spoke with uh, both Russian officials and people close with Russia who were interested in speaking to him precisely because they understood that he was, as he was, a named policy consultant for the, the campaign. So it's true that he tried to make the most of that status, but more importantly for now, others approached him. They told him about the hacked emails several months before they were generally known, the hacked emails of the, the DNC, and they wanted to play ball with him and give him incriminating uh, evidence about Hillary Clinton specifically so that the campaign could profit from it, the, the, the Trump campaign. So it's kind of beside the point for the president to now say, yes, he lied, 
that was just what got him in the door, what, what gave Mueller the leverage to make Papadopoulos cooperate and, and talk with him. But it's the content of what he did while a named consultant for the campaign that really has everyone in Washington talking and has everyone in the Oval Office sweating. Okay, legally though, and the Trump administration keeps pushing this line, they say he was not a paid staff member, he was a low-level volunteer. Can Trump therefore legally disassociate himself with whatever Papadopoulos' actions were along those lines? No. And by the same token, by the way, Manafort was also unpaid. It's, a, it's something that commended themselves to Trump. Trump liked very much having unpaid consultants. And he, he brought him up and praised him, be Papadopoulos, before. But the, the, the question is not, again, whether Trump and the Oval Office is somehow directly responsible for the lie. That's not the issue. It's the evidence that Papadopoulos now will provide has to provide under the plea agreement, and that evidence is about collusion with the campaign. If Russia is out there colluding with anyone, even if it's someone who, in fact, is not part of the, the campaign, which is not the case here, that, that shows that's of great interest because that's the, that's the basic uh, point that people want to examine. What was the relationship between the Russian government and the, the Trump campaign? But as for the notion that he wasn't part of the campaign, that's, that's um, risable. Uh, he was someone whom Trump had, had praised as one of his few named foreign policy consultants. Sure, like other people uh, in the campaign, he was looking to make the most of his title, maybe okay. puffing a little. But the point, but the point is the, the, that Russia wanted to meet with him, tell them about, tell him about the dirt they had right. on Hillary Clinton precisely because of his status. And, and another part, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, another part of what seems to be Trump's strategy now is this deflection. It's a year after the election and he continues to push and bring up an investigation uh, into Clinton's emails in a way just to say, well, whatever right. she did is worse than what I may have done. So that's where investigators need to put uh, the priority. Do you think, first of all, do you think it's a premeditated strategy here? And do you think it will work because his supporters have bought it before? So I think it is premeditated in the sense that it is a page out of his playbook. He does it a lot. He did it in the, in the campaign. It's perfectly irrelevant because what, what Mueller has been engaged to do is look at the activities of the campaign and anything that uh, flow from it. Will it work? It's an interesting question. There have been episode after episode here in D.C. where people said, well, now uh, people will, do, will abandon Trump. Now people will understand that Trump isn't honest, et cetera. And while that has happened at the margins, there still seems to be a kind of core of 30 percent of the of the public who say we don't care. Uh, this is old old business. The Democrats do it too. Hillary was worse, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. I, I think that it may well work with a small part of, with more than a small part of the of the electorate. The question is, will it work with the everybody in Congress and the sort of broad middle? Okay, and you trust uh, Robert Mueller to, to carry out this investigation thoroughly, honestly, fully professionally, correct? Everybody who's ever been around him does. He, he, he's, he's right out of central casting. He's, you know, part Henry Fonda, part Jimmy Stewart, okay. part John Wayne. I've worked with him, but he is the real deal more than anybody in the country. So our... Gerald, Jared Kushner and Donald Trump Jr. probably next, in your opinion? So I don't know. One of the things that make him such a great professional is he and his whole staff are completely buttoned down, don't say anything. But the reason focus is now turned on Kushner and Trump Jr., as well as Manafort, is they had a very similar episode to the one that, that put um, Papadopoulos in the soup uh, with their meeting that um, you may have read about in June of 2016 with uh, a Russian lawyer that they thought also was going to be giving dirt on Hillary Clinton. 
if in fact the FBI interviewed them about that and if in fact they were not 100% truthful, they are in trouble. Remember, Papadopoulos's lie here was, was somewhat at the margins of his overall account, but it was still a lie and they came after him hard. If Kushner and Trump Jr. have done the same thing, they're, they're in trouble and recall that President Trump uh, helped concoct a false uh, version of what had happened at that meeting uh, originally to make it seem innocuous. Harry Littman, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us from Washington on this edition <laughs> of the Newsmakers. using cars against people. I mean, I walk up that road every day, you know, to go to wherever, and it's, I mean, you just have to be very, very careful. Next time, we take a look at what the terrorist attack in New York means for Donald Trump's policy of extreme vetting of immigrants. Meanwhile, you can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Andrea Sankey. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.